we have what I would call the perfect uh, speaker with us today, Maggie Lewis. And Maggie is a professor at Seton Hall University, at Seton Hall Law School, I should call it, and is what I would call a national committee, a model worker. She does so much for the national committee that it's hard to actually enumerate all of the things that she does because they're so plentiful. Most importantly, and partly she so fulfills the message, the, the, the mission of our public intellectuals program. She was a member of the second cohort. We've now have had six cohorts of our public intellectuals program. And the idea is for our public intellectuals to engage in discussions of US-China relations and China in the United States. The National Committee doesn't take a position on what they should say. We just take a position is they should participate in that dialogue. And Maggie perfectly does that. She has accompanied congressional staff, delegations to China. She briefs our delegations before they go to China. She's a participant in our track two rule of law dialogue. Uh, she just did a podcast for us on Tsai Ing-wen which we posted five days ago and has already received 5,000 downloads. So clearly we're dealing with a new generation rock star, um, but she truly is our Lao Dong Mo Fang and a close friend. So Maggie, you'll talk for 10, 15 minutes about the China Initiative. I'll ask some questions and we've got a very distinguished and knowledgeable audience. Then we'll open the floor to, uh, to questions. Maggie, take it away. Thanks, Steve. And the National Committee does so much for me. I'm always happy to give back. And thanks, everyone, for signing on. It's at least a gorgeous day here in New Jersey. And I definitely will not talk for more than 15 minutes because I do want this to be a conversation. And uh, I come at these issues as someone who works and teaches in criminal justice, both in China, about China, and about the United States. And even during the Obama administration, I was already getting concerned about the way the US government was discussing foreign threats, foreign threats in general, but increasingly about China. So you saw increasing use, for example, of economic espionage. This is taking trade secret theft and elevating it to a national security concern and a very serious federal crime. You also saw the FBI putting together more threat awareness briefings, threat awareness films. You can Google Company Man, Game of Pawns, but getting out the message that there was uh, a concern about national security threats coming from China and these were being dealt with through the criminal law. So when we fast forward to November of 2018, which is, you know, it's actually not that long ago, but it, it feels long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, given where we are today. But uh, then Jeff, Jeff Sessions was attorney general. He stands up and he announces this China initiative. It is highly unusual, if not unprecedented, to have the name of a place, of a country, be the name of an initiative by the Department of Justice. And again, this wasn't completely new. It wasn't like the China Initiative in November 2018 sprung fully formed from the head of the Department of Justice. There were already concerns, but you saw then a, a real coalescing and an enhancing of resources looking at a China threat. And this has only gained momentum under Attorney General Barr. He has uh, praised the China Initiative. You have uh, the director of the FBI, Christopher Wray, speaking about a thousand approximately active investigations across the United States that are tied to the China Initiative. This, I mean, I think it's important to say this doesn't tell us what the prevalence of criminal behavior is, uh, but it does tell us that the US government is putting significant resources behind the China initiative and that really trying to root out what's happening. And then the question is how much attrition there will be from these investigations, because of course, many will not actually result in prosecutions and convictions. Now, the heart of the China initiative are these concerns about espionage, about intellectual property theft, and uh, the quintessential case there being the stealing of the arm of Tappy the robot out of the T-Mobile lab in Washington, you know, physically trying to take the intellectual property. But it's not just about protecting IP. You also see what uh, Rory Truex at Princeton, an, another Pipper, another public intellectual program fellow who's working on these issues, what he calls compromising relationships. 
this idea that there are people who have ties to the PRC, universities there, the government, and that uh, either they should have been disclosing and they have not, or they otherwise are making them a national concern, uh, security concern. And for this, you look to the prosecution that's going on right now of Professor Lieber at Harvard. And so he is being prosecuted federally, essentially because of false statements, that he didn't disclose his connections to a university in China and the receipt of significant money under these talent recruitment plans, the Thousand Talent Initiative and other similar programs. So that's another concern of the China Initiative, is who has ties to China and those have not been disclosed as they were required to be under federal law. Now, I came to this partially, too, because about a year ago, or even less, so November of 2019, the District of New Jersey reached out to Seton Hall to ask if we could host one of these threat awareness briefings. And they wanted us to give them a chance, as they do all over the US, to reach out to industry. You know, Big Pharma is in New Jersey. And as part of hosting uh, this threat awareness briefing, uh, they got me on the panel, <laughs> you know, which was part of the bargain. But it was really interesting for me to hear the language being used this whole of government threat, the response, the whole of society threat, that China being presented as an existential threat to the United States. And you see that language also being used in, for example, in February, the Center for, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies in DC hosted a almost full day conference on the China Initiative. Attorney General Barr spoke, Director Ray spoke, a number of the US attorneys spoke. And the way that they present the nature of this threat is existential, is that, you know, will the world go through the US or through China in the future? And so there's a real sense of this is a dire, uh, a dire security threat that needs to be addressed. Now, what was posted along with the materials for today is a forthcoming article, which is very much in draft stage. And that is, uh, it's, it's a hard, a crim theory piece. I'm, I'm asking, you know, what are the standards that the Department of Justice sets for itself? And does this initiative live up to those standards? And, and first, you know, what is even the China of the China initiative? And the note of that is the PRC party state, the PRC government. But one problem I have is that when the PRC party state is discussed, you often get this language of communist China, and um, which conveys a certain kind of threat and also uh, parts of our history, which I don't think we want to revisit. But beyond sweeping the government, which is what we should be concerned about, I think, you also get in the China initiative framing and in the way it's carried out, language that includes within this idea of China, peoples whose DNA is connected to China, that they are ethnically Han Chinese, you know, Han Chinese or other ethnicities, that they hold a passport, their nationality is that of the PRC, their national origin was, even if they've since changed their nationality. And even more broadly, what I call people who have connections that gives them a sense of China-ness. And, and by that, I mean, you will have prosecutions and convictions under the China Initiative of people who are white, who have no apparent physical connection to China. But in the press releases, you'll sometimes have language like, and he speaks fluent Chinese, which you know, I wonder why is that relevant to the press release? Are we supposed to now be wary of someone who speaks fluent Chinese? So I think that this concept of China is way too broad as it's being used by the US government. And then secondly, I go into my piece, and I won't do a lot here with this, about the, the principles behind punishment. Because you know, if the Department of Justice is going to bring a criminal prosecution, that's a huge decision. And we're taking away people's liberty with oftentimes that we prosecute people because they think they're worthy of punishment. And why do we punish people? To deter, to incapacitate, to rehabilitate, and because we think retribution is deserved. And even looking under these you know, basic principles, I think the China Initiative is problematic, in part because I fear over-deterrence the way it's being carried out, and sometimes under-deterrence, that we're so focused on one threat, what are we not looking at by putting those blinders on? You know, rehabilitation is certainly not a focus here. Um, incapacitation, are we building walls and the decoupling that comes with some of these decisions? And retribution. There's a sense that somehow people are more morally blameworthy because of the IP theft being connected somehow to the PRC. And then also in the China Initiative, it's like China is being anthropomorphized into an actor itself. 
So you'll have Attorney General Barr talk about China's malign behavior or that we need to deter China. And, and China is not an actor that can be subject to the criminal law. And that gives me this overall sense that I worry that we've got the Department of Justice taking on both a national security role and dealing with individual criminal prosecutions. And, and that creates tension. And I don't think it's being addressed fully. And also we get this sense of the ratcheting up of the national security concerns. And this is where I think we need to think about, even though national security is so important when we think about the US-China relationship, are we over-securitizing? Are we putting too much emphasis? Especially now where we really need the cooperation. I mean, we need cooperation scientifically. The U.S. benefits from cooperation and from open borders. Uh, today, Macro Polo just came out with a report about flows of talent for artificial intelligence and how much the U.S. has benefited from those flows from China to the U.S. And the more we erect barriers to having that talent come to the U.S., we're hurting ourselves. And it's not just talent from China. These tend to also lead to more general barricades to foreign nationals for foreigners coming to the U.S. And so it has a broader concern there, too. So that's my kind of 30,000 word monster, which is, is in the draft stage. So I want to make uh, three points clear and then just finish with a few suggestions before I end. First, I want to be clear, there is a threat. There is no doubt that people connected to the PRC party state are engaged in IP theft and other acts that are illegal under US law. But I think we need to think very carefully about what is the scope and the nature of that threat and what is the best response. Uh, second, you know, that the beyond a reasonable doubt standard has not been relaxed. This is not blunt guilt by association. Uh, I do though think that there is threat by association, that people with certain connections to China are being viewed with enhanced scrutiny, and we need to think of that fair. And third, I want to emphasize how much we don't know, that prosecutors are a notoriously opaque part of our government. It's really hard to know what they're doing, and it makes it even harder when there's this national security overlay. And, and I'm sure Eliza Orleans could tell us a gazillion stories about times she wanted something from prosecutors in New York City for a non-national security case, and they didn't give it to her, right? So part of it is that it makes it hard to do a regression analysis and say at what percentage higher are people of certain you know, Chinese ethnicity being prosecuted, because we just don't know. We need more information information from the government. And I, but I applaud efforts to try to do that. But even if we don't have that empirical analysis of you know, X higher rate of prosecutions, at a minimum, the initiative goes against the fundamental desire for non-discrimination, which is embedded in the principles that drive the Justice Department. It is at least intention and I think undermines it. And second, I think we can just do a better job of protecting interests. Instead of saying, you know, you see like uh, John Demers, who's the assistant attorney general for national security, saying, I want to see all, not each of the 94 U.S. attorney's offices having a case under the China initiative. Like that starts sounding a lot like a quota. You go find it. Instead of doing that, I want the U.S. government to identify what are the assets, what are the things we want to protect. And then we protect those IP, those national security, you know, the launch codes from threats wherever they come from. That's how I'd rather have us go about this. Identify what's important and then protect those without saying we've already decided who is the threat to those interests. Uh, how to make this better? Ditch the China initiative na name. It's doing no good. I think a country neutral framing is critical for non-discrimination reasons. Um, second, we need more intra-government cooperation the Department of Justice is not, an, uh, and, and I'm sure there's people right now who are on this from the US government who are laughing because I know it's very hard to get cooperation within the government, easy to say from the ivory tower. But the reality is the Department of Justice does not have deep country and linguistic expertise. Uh, they have someone from the FBI, usually in the embassy in Beijing, an assistant US attorney. They have a, uh, an office of international affairs. But the people I see working on this don't seem to know a lot about China, and that worries me. Uh, I also think we need to build non-criminal alternatives. We generally don't want to go to the criminal law as our first line of defense. Uh, we want to find ways, whether it be through auditing mechanisms, better scrutiny of grants. Uh, and the Department of Justice itself says don't prosecute when there's an adequate non-criminal alternative to prosecution. There are efforts to start looking at ways to do that, but they need to go further. We need to look at Congress because Congress writes the laws that the Department of Justice actually enforces. So if there's bad laws, it's probably going to make it easier to have bad prosecutions. We need also better cooperation between the government and the private sector, academia and businesses. 
you're starting to see that. The FBI had an academic summit uh, last year. Um, that's harder now with COVID. But my, um, my sense and talking to people is that it's still more the FBI and Department of Justice more generally either coming to, to say, here is the threat and describe it or wanting information rather than working collaboratively really with academia and the private sector to figure out how to deal with this. And then finally, in my last minute um, or so, I, I want to, um, you know, with Steve starting, you know, mentioning where our country is now, and I, I think that's so important here, because it's not just where our country is, but where our planet is. And I teach criminal procedure. I am discussing with my students right now about what it means to have another unarmed black man killed at the hands of the police. And the protests are so much focused on the cops on the street, but that, you know, pushing out of not just racism, but all kinds of bias needs to occur from the cop on the beat all the way to the attorney general. And, and we're seeing here too with COVID increasing discrimination against people of Asian heritage. And I applaud the national committee, which has been doing programming on that. And I encourage people to follow that. But you know, what work is being done, not only to root out the explicit bias, the racism that's so much a part of our country, but the implicit bias. So you'll see members of the Department of Justice say, yeah, we have the China initiative, but we love the Chinese people. We welcome the Chinese people. And you know, for me, I hear that as a woman who, when someone says something sexist to me, if they then say, but I'm not sexist, that doesn't mean what they just said wasn't sexist. It just meant they just invalidated my lived experience. And that serves as a micro invalidation of the discrimination people are facing rather than as an antidote to this overall framing. So I wanna know what's work is being done because ultimately what I would love to see is that we come out of all these hard times with the more just justice department. So I'll leave it there and um, open it up to Steve and wherever the questions go. That was fabulous, Maggie, fabulous. The, the um, step back and think about, we've never had this before, but we had this whole line of prosecutions prior to the China Initiative of people who were either paid by the mainland right. government, paid by Ministry of State Security that were engaging in some form of IP theft or, or, or something else. The, what should we have done? In other words, thinking back, so it's November or it's September of 2018, you're sitting at justice and there are all these things going on and you're going, you know, our local US attorneys are not aware of this problem. Yeah, and I think we go back much further than 2018. Uh, and you know, part of this has to do, again, I think about linguistic and country and, and expertise, uh, that you know, it's, it's hard, unfortunately, right now, and it's been this tr true for a while, but even more so, to get a security clearance if you have deep experience actually living and working and studying in China. So we need to find ways to get that expertise into the government to make it valued. We need to make it so, you know, as I said, that we could have much earlier had much better non-criminal approaches. So, you know, NIH, so we have all these big government bodies that give these huge grants out. And a lot of times, I'm a professor, there's times we sign things, yeah, I've disclosed this, whatever. But I don't think we took seriously enough what really was required to make it so that people could understand these disclosures matter and you are required to let us know who else you're working with. So much more work could have been done on that. So I think suddenly people you know, said, we gotta hit the heavy hammer of the criminal law when in fact there could have been a much more collaborative and um, a more step-by-step, -step, more moderate approach to at least addressing maybe not the PLA army guys who are hacking into computers. I mean, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a much bigger swath of people who are technically violating US laws. But at the same time, we need to figure out how much of those are the real nefarious actors. And on the other end of the spectrum, absent-minded professors. And there's a lot of space in between. Do we have data on, is it possible to get that? As you say, a prosecutor decision is a black box. Do we have data on whether people are being questions or questioned or taken in or prosecuted uh, because of their ethnicity? And people we have a lot of data. Relating to, we have a lot of data relating to African-Americans. To a certain extent, you know, some of this has been um, put together. There was an article in the Cardoza Law Review a few years ago that was coding for names that were um, seemed Chinese. But part of it too is it's not that the Department of Justice says, you know, this person was 
you know, you know, had, you know, mom from China, dad from wherever, you know, so part of it's trying to suss out what do we even code for to figure out who counts as the, the China or the Chinese here. Um, and then we do have, so we do have some information, but we oftentimes don't know how many cases have dropped out. And I want to be clear here that it's not necessarily a bad thing that a prosecutor drops a case. And I think there's been definitely clear instances where someone who was ethnically Chinese was essentially persecuted, that they were a scientist and they were put through the ringer. And this goes way back. I mean, Wen Ho Lee is Wen Ho Lee being who was Taiwanese, which is even more interesting. And he was Taiwanese and, and, a, and a, not a Waishang Ren. His family didn't come over with the KMT, the Nationalist Party. His family was there when the Japanese were there. So that was definitely based on what he looked like. So there are those examples. But an investigation can start, and then if the government finds we don't have enough to meet that beyond a reasonable doubt standard, I want them to drop that. I want them to drop that case. So just dropping a case alone doesn't show that they aren't doing their job well. It could actually, you know, wrong. They could actually be doing a good job and seeing that there's been a change. So part of the difficulty, too, is sussing out what is a good reason for having the case start, what's a bad reason for having it start. But finally, I'll just say the statistic I would like to learn more about is about sentencing because you know then we can get real statistics and if it turns out that people who are prosecuted under the china initiative or who are you know ethnically chinese are receiving more significant sentences actually punished more than people who commit, say, IP theft of the same value but are not Chinese, that I think would be very telling because that would be saying, we think you are more deserving of punishment because of the China connection. And how does the NIH kind of instruction to all of its grant recipients that they've got to look at, at kind of foreign funding and are people, as you mentioned, filling out these applications incorrectly and are not disclosing that they're getting grants from others. Uh, then I'll get to the Libra case and say, do you have any idea what went on? <laughs> the real story there, it's somewhat in, incomprehensible, but for the first, the then to Libra. Yeah, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm someone who has absolutely no intellectual property. I mean, I talk about human rights, right? You know, there's nothing, nothing proprietary there. I want it to spread. Uh, so, you know, but if you are, but I have worked on government grants before, and there's a lot of paperwork, even for a grant that has to do with dealing with death penalty reforms in China, which has no national security concerns. And so I think a part of it is just, there's been a lot of paperwork from a lot of different organizations, different parts of the government. It hasn't been streamlined. It hasn't been made more accessible. Um, I, do, I, I do know there's been efforts, for example, with the White House Office uh, of the Science Policy Advisor. He's also gotten involved in this and trying to figure out how to create um, kind of a more user-friendly, a more streamlined, a more integrated grant review process and ongoing mechanisms. So, but my sense is there's just a lot of cooks in this kitchen and they haven't figured out a way to do it in a more efficient and effective way. Do you think China's an existential threat? Isn't um, that, does, does a lot of this stem from, you know, so in, in um, December of, of 2017, you know, National Security Council appointed by the president comes out with a national security strategy, which says China's a strategic competitor and a uh, revisionist power. And then a lot of follow on documents to that. So is China, an existential threat? And should we be applying different standards for China-related crimes versus others? I think China's an existential threat to Hong Kong. That's another conversation. We've been having those. And that fundamentally, you know, you think of an existential threat, you know, fundamentally threatening the way you live your life, like upending that apple cart, that it'll be totally different. And so I don't think right now that China is an existential threat to the US. And by repeating that, I worry that we make that you know, our focus. And again, we get that ratcheting up, then everything becomes a national security concern because it is an existential threat. And, and you know, you've been in meetings when I've had some wonderful exchanges from uh, people in China where I disagree vehemently about their view about many things with civil and political rights. And, and so, you know, I think that if we view China as an existential threat, if we discontinue, whether you want to call it engagement, connectivity, some kind of 
actually interacting with each other that we're only going down a bad path. And it makes me think of uh, the fog of war. Um, if you've seen this great documentary and, and, and thinking about with McNamara saying how vastly wrong the U.S. was about the intentions of leaders in Vietnam and, and how they proceeded with assumptions about domino theory. And I think we need, you know, thinking of Mattis, who is one of my, you know, current heroes, that we need to read history. And, and I really worry about the existential threat as framing, as repeating mistakes from our history. Yeah. Obviously, you know why I agree with you. How does, how does Huawei fit into all of this? And how does Meng Wanzhou's detention and potential extradition to the United States fit in? Yeah, so how does uh, Huawei, the 5G, I will leave that to the tech people because I'm just so glad that I have all this tech because my children are right now in a karate class using all this technology. But, um, but as far as Meng Wanzhou, um, you know, that's been fascinating to follow. I'm not a Canadian lawyer. Um, you know, there just was the decision, though, that uh, the dual criminality standard was met, so we are proceeding forward. Uh, for me, um, I think it's really important that whatever happens with that case, that the U.S. treats this as a rule of law being legal decision, not a political decision that's going to one day there's going to be a tweet that, you know, suddenly the U.S. doesn't want anymore, because I think that would damage our already extremely damaged reputation. I'd also also just say that while Meng Wanzhou is living a fairly comfortable, albeit deprived of liberty to a certain extent life in Vancouver, uh, Michael Covering and Michael Spavro have remained in custody in China now for 500 some days. And I don't think they've seen, you know, certainly haven't seen a lawyer or their family. And we don't even know what they're being held for. So the double standard is huge. And what about the uh East, as part of the China Initiative, the Eastern District converted the charges to a RICO indictment of Huawei. Yeah, and RICO is interesting because I, I tell my criminal procedure students that RICO is like a prosecutor's, it's like birthday, Christmas, Hanukkah wrapped up in one. I mean, RICO is a very powerful way for prosecutors to go after you know, sort of organizations and you know, group criminality. And, um, and so I haven't delved into the, the, the the discrete evidence, but um, RICO has always been a powerful tool of federal prosecutors. You look at breaking up the mob or any you know, other times. So once you pull out RICO, there's a lot of power to sweep a number of people and both legal people, legal persons and natural persons in its scope. So that's serious. Mm -hmm. that, that elevated indictment, it, it seemed to have taken a lot of prior material and simply elevated it to a RICO case without putting anything new, except saying this was a conspiracy, you know, a racketeering and corrupt influence conspiracy. So did I miss something there? Well, two things interesting. So, you know, there have been civil cases about intellectual property infringements against Huawei. And so one, you know, response from Huawei has been, this is basically recycling and ratcheting up civil cases that we've dealt with. And I think, you know, Mark Cohen, my, I think is on here from Berkeley and he'll has wonderful writings explaining how we've had this criminalization of intellectual property concerns more generally. So part of it is, you know, yes, it, it did seem to be ratcheting up. One thing too, that was interesting was that when, uh, Bill Barr was at the CSIS China conference in February. It was about a week before that indictment came out. And he spoke directly about Huawei, about what a concern it was. And he basically foreshadowed that we're coming down even harder on Huawei. So this is certainly, um, when you think of the expressive function of the criminal law, that it's not just necessarily about that individual case, but about general deterrence. This is, a, I think, a clear example where the Justice Department wants to send a very loud, clear message beyond this individual case. Should we be multi, multilateralizing this? Should we be doing this with, our, with the EU, with the Japanese, with the Koreans, with, with others? Would that help? Yes, and, and, and in fact, when the China Initiative was announced in November of 2018, one of the cases involved a, a company based in Taiwan, and, and the Taiwanese, the Ministry of Justice, was helpful to the United States in building that case. And, um, you know, and I, I spent a lot of time in Taiwan. I'm always happy to highlight how Taiwan can help. So we should be looking at this not as just a bilateral issue, but as a multilateral. How do we think about the standards that are important? How are we going to cooperate on the big level about you know, 
thinking about what kind of intellectual property laws we want to have, but also that on the micro level, you have to get evidence, you have to have depositions, you have to get people extradited. And that's going to require a lot of cooperation amongst a number, number of governments. My last question, because we have got a couple of dozen questions that have already come up. Um, this is the, the head of the former head of policy planning at the State Department said that um, Chiron Skinner said that this is the first time we've had a strategic competition with a non-white civilization. She seemed, this was, and she's an African American actually. She seemed to have forgotten World War II with Japan, but that aside, how troubled are you kind of about the, the, the racial approach of folks in government these days in the context of the, uh, the China initiative? I'm hugely troubled about the racial overtones when it comes to people in the US who are black, who are Asian. And, and so, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not Asian American. And I think it's an extremely important to have allies, to have allyship, to not have the burden just be put on people who have a heritage that ties back to China to take on this as their cause. But beyond being an ally, I think it's important to recognize it's not just about helping people who are ethnically Chinese or PRC nationals, that this matters for all of us. These values are important for every American. So we're helping ourselves by trying to root out this discrimination. And just finally, I'd say, you know, I, if, if people um, who are on this, if they've never taken an IAT, one of these implicit assumption tests, you can just Google IAT. Um, what they do is they have you look at whether it be based on age, gender, race, um, ethnicity, how you respond implicitly to people who look differently. And it's fascinating because it turns out that those of us who think that, you know, I'm not, I'm totally open minded, I'm not biased, we all have bias. The question is just how much. So we need to confront that bias before we can mitigate it. First question, an easy one, I hope, from Bill Armbruster. Brewster, who is the baseball player depicted in the painting on the wall behind you? Buck Leonard. <laughs> That's my husband's. It's Buck Leonard. He was in, he never was in Major League Baseball. He was in um, what was then the Negro Leagues in like the 1930s. This is like Jeopardy now. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Krasenstein, uh, do members of the Department of Justice feel that many of today's initiatives in dealing with China may be reversed if we have a new president next January. Yeah, you know, and I and I want to say too that you know I have friends who are federal prosecutors, and I appreciate that they're out there keeping me and my family safe. And I'm really trying to be generous in saying there's there's a lot of people who are trying to do good work here, um, and so there's those who are you know the the. The career uh, assistant U.S. attorneys, the line prosecutors, they're pedaling the bicycle. Uh, and then above them, you have the political appointees. And I think there's no doubt that the messaging coming from all the way up to A.G. Barr is hugely important. Or, you know, the assistant, John Demers, for the assistant attorney general for national security to say, I'm looking at you out there, prosecutors, are you finding these cases? So a change in leadership is no doubt going to have a, a difference. The question is how much? And I'm hopeful that with the right person being put in at the top, that we could see a seismic change and, um, and, and certainly um, just leaving this framing of the China initiative by the wayside. This one's from Mark Elliott at Harvard. I'm not sure if you can answer it, but of the estimated 1,000 ongoing investigations that are part of this initiative, do you know approximately how many or what percentage are focused on graduate students in degree programs at universities? Absolutely no idea. You know, and I think so APA Justice is trying to get some data scientists on this. I mean, part of it too is, you know, we're, there's nothing, it, these are sort of non-falsifiable claims. Like tell us, you know, prove that Chinese graduate students are not involved in espionage. I can't, right? You know, prove that aliens never landed in New Mexico. Um, and, and so we don't, we don't know what's, we don't know so much. I feel like we're to that Rumsfeld, you know, there's no knowns and unknown unknowns. And um, so we don't know, but I think these are things that we can A, demand that there be more transparency, just to throw that thousand number out there and not give a, a, a more granular data is, is problematic. That deserves a pushback on DOJ will tell us more. Um, and, and I think just, 
even if we find out that number, the chilling effect is huge. And you add on to that legislation being thrown out there, you know, or bills by Tom Cotton and others that is just flat out saying, we don't want you here if you're even going to try to study in the STEM fields. I mean, that is shooting ourselves in the foot. And you know, who would want to come here? Right. Emily Weinstein asks, what are your thoughts on the legality and legal ramification of Trump's recent proclamation regarding the possible revocation of F and J visas for Chinese students and scholars, which is exactly what you were just talking about? Well, I mean, so it's the ramifications are, are huge beyond you know the criminal justice realm, right? You've got huge issues with um, just that there's a lot of Chinese students in our universities, so it's it's a it's a revenue issue for universities. It's huge for our ability to have this open, collaborative research environment. As I said, I recommend this uh, new report that just came out from Macro Polo about artificial intelligence and um, and information and talent flows. The brain drain for China has generally benefited the U.S. If we make pathways for people who have studied in the U.S., gotten PhDs here to stay here, many of them will accept and want to use those pathways, but they're just shrinking, if not being like flat out putting a roadblock in front of them. And, and just more generally, um, you know, it's, I don't want to discount the stress that is caused by living under a cloud of I'm seen as someone who is suspicious. And that's, that wears on people. And, and this has been talked about with respect to um, Black Lives Matter and, and just generally how stressful it is to be out there as someone who is Black and interacting with the police. It's stressful to be a, someone of Chinese ethnicity who is working in a STEM field right now. And I think that you can't quantify, but it's real. This is from Hiroki Taku. Takuchi, I may have a Chinese pronunciation of a Japanese name, uh, who's at SMU in Dallas. How much does China, does the China initiative target individual people instead of cases of companies slash organizations? For example, Japanese electronic giant NEC hires lots of Chinese engineers with PhDs from Japanese university. Japan is a US ally. And NEC is doing business with the United States, working with the U.S. federal government, too. Is that problematic? Yeah, and so part of this is interesting because you can have, you know, like corporate criminal liability. You see this, you know, for example, with the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, where you'll have a company, an actual corporate entity, being the defendant in a case. But most of these cases are about prosecuting an individual person, you know, someone who is out there. I'm thinking of like you know, Mara Histendahl has a great book, The Scientist and the, you know, the Spy, uh, about stealing of the Monsanto uh, corn seeds. And someone was actually, Robert Moe was out there in the field, like, picking up the corn seeds, right? There's some person who is the person being charged with these crimes. Um, and so you, I think that's one of the points that I really want to make clear is that, you know, when we talk about these big, you know, Huawei, um, but there's a person who could end up behind bars. Huawei doesn't end up behind bars. You know, they can have large monetary fines, which can be civil in nature, they can be criminal in nature, but these cases are taking away the liberty of people, and 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 that's something where we really need to take pause. But um, but it could be both. It could be people. It could be entities. Another question on Huawei: uh, What prospects does Huawei CFO Sabrina Mung have of receiving a fair trial in the United States, given this DOJ initiative, which is politically as well as national security driven? I think she has a very good chance, actually, because if she, she's got, first of all, she's got great lawyers and she's got enough money to keep those great lawyers, lawyers going for years. In this case, if, if it stretches out the way that's anticipated, will likely take years. This is not going to be resolved quickly unless for some reason it is dropped. So no, in our system, you know, over 90% of cases plead out. So, and most of the China Initiative cases are similarly not resulting in jury trials, but rather in plea bargains. So it's possible that she might come and, and have a plea. My sense is that she would probably carry this through to a jury trial. And, and I think you could find 12 Americans who, you know, don't want, you know, who, who, you know, the questioning is done well, that wouldn't look at her, you know, with 
it, it's too much bias because she's Chinese. But it's interesting thinking of Mara Histendahl's book about Robert Mo, that there the judge had said that there couldn't be um, references to his Chinese ethnicity by the lawyers as part of the case partially out of concern that it would emphasize this as being part of sort of a China initiative. This was before the China initiative, but part of a China threat. So I do think she can get a fair trial here. Um, and, and the point is too, she would get a trial. Is that, but just because I live across the river from Brooklyn, is that an Eastern District of New York trial? Is, is that where the indictment issue? Yeah, and that's my understanding. And that's, I think that's where it should be. I haven't, you know, and, you know, it could, and if there was some reason that New York was seen as um, problematic, it is always possible to move it somewhere else um, in, in the United States. That happens occasionally. Usually you don't change venue with federal case. But um, I, I, I'm not that, that's, of all the worries here that Sabrina Mung is not going to get a fair trial is, is, I'm much more worried about the people who can't afford lawyers, who are having serious federal prosecutions, and they don't have those deep pockets, because then they're all the more likely to try to have to plead out because they can't adequately fight this. And we have a great public defender system, the federal defenders are great, um, but if they don't qualify for that, or, you know, even if they do, uh, they're still outgunned by the by the Department of Justice. Yeah. Uh, Matt Turpin, hi Matt, uh, asks, he kind of wants to look at it from the other end. Does China think the United States is an existential threat to it? Oh, I, the last thing I probably should do is try to speak for Joe Nanhai. Um, you know, I, there's, you know, one thing that's been um, uh, interesting out of all the, the turmoil and the sadness that's going on right now in the U.S. is how the protests in the U.S. are being uh, portrayed in the media in China and certainly by the wolf warriors on, on Twitter. And I think the way the U.S. would become an existential threat or at least more of a threat to China is the more that we have police officers who stop and actually march with the protesters. The more that we have uh, these protests leading to actual structural reform through our elected officials, the more that we can show that the US does value civil and political rights and has ways that people can voice their concerns and have their elected leaders either respond to those concerns or be elected out. I mean, that's the way I think the US becomes an existential threat. Yeah. Uh, Eric Heyer at, at BYU asks, is China retaliating for the China Initiative? Obviously, we know that Meng Wanzhou, right. there was a direct retaliation of the arrest of two Canadians. But for the China Initiative generally, have we seen retaliation? You know, I don't, I haven't seen anything that's sort of a tit for tat based on the China Initiative, but I, I certainly, you know, you, you have both know a lot more people that I can explain about how the business environment in China um, has become increasingly fraught for, for foreigners. Uh, and certainly there is a history of using uh, criminal sanctions against foreign companies. Um, oftentimes it's because you know, they did violate the law. So you look back, like some of the big pharmaceutical companies ran into problems with bribery laws in China. Uh, but I, I haven't seen an explicit um, or even you know, implicit, but doesn't take hard to figure out, we're doing this because of the China initiative other than the Huawei situation. Um, Robert Percival asks, has this led to an increase in enforcement of the uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act at all? Yeah, and that's, you know, and the FCPA is so interesting, in part because, boy, that can be a real cash cow for the government. And, and we saw an increase in the FCPA before the Trump administration. So again, this, this, goes, this goes back. And, and, and overall, I mean, I, I think it's good to support um, uh, anti-corruption efforts. I don't want to say we should get um, rid of it. I, I don't know if anyone's found a correlation, let alone a causal mechanism uh, between the China Initiative and the FCPA. There's very distinct concerns being aired as part of the China Initiative. Um, although certainly the, the, the harder it is to do business in China, the less perhaps opportunities there are to engage in behaviors that would, um, that would get you under the FCPA. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth Lynch. Uh, from China Law and Policy asks, uh, to what degree do you think the DOJ can be convinced to change its behavior, e.g. casting less of a wide net, given that the current administration seems to be using being hard on China as a campaign platform? And two, can you discuss some of the similarities and differences between what we are seeing here and what happened under McCarthyism? 
Yeah, so the first question, I know just this is very anecdotal, but I've had conversations with people who, again, are more the line prosecutors, not the higher level political appointees, and they want to do better. I mean, even things like when I bring up working on learning to pronounce Chinese names better, learning pinyin, because just as a sign of respect, being able to pronounce correctly the name of the people that you're prosecuting would go some distance to show at least some attempt to have some cultural competency. And, and some of those even, are you getting briefings? Are there ways that we can draw on resources in academia to give you briefings? Sometimes that has gotten some good responses, but these are pretty low level people I'm talking to. I think we really do need a change in leadership, which requires a change in who um, probably is in the White House to, to make this really systemic. Um, you know, as far as the echoes of McCarthyism, as I said, I do worry when um, you hear this talking about communist China, because, I mean, yeah, technically it's the Chinese Communist Party, but, I mean, Marx would roll over in his grave if you're like, hey, this is the communism that you were setting up. It's an authoritarian government, you know, it is deeply... Um, illiberal, but the way that um, the word communism is used in some of these threat awareness briefings does draw on the worst of that kind of, we should be afraid because of this um, political threat. And, and it makes me think, we're a, a dear friend of our families, when I was growing up in Madison, Wisconsin, Abner Brody was a law professor at the University of Wisconsin, and his, and his wife had gone and walked around to try to get signatures to recall Senator McCarthy. And I remember her saying, Agnes, that she took their young child in the stroller because then people wouldn't yell at her in the same way when she showed up to try to get a signature. Wow. Interesting. Uh, Dr. Xiao Zhang Li was a neuroscientist at Emory University, was arrested for national security offenses, and it resulted ultimately in tax charges which reminded many of the Wen Ho Lee case. Do you think whenever a Chinese American is arrested, su suspected of national security offenses, and the law enforcement later finds out they don't have a case, they have to find some offense to justify the arrest, regardless of whether the offense matches the resources spent? Yeah, and this again, this is so much about what are the messaging coming from the hires up. If the higher ups are saying, you should be looking for these cases. You're not taking this seriously unless you find them, then that's sending a very distinct message. Um, and so I worry when I hear that messaging. That said, I mean, there's a lot of times that people are uh, convicted of something that is not essentially what was the initial wrongdoing. I mean, think of Martha Stewart, you know, you end up with obstruction of justice charges, not that it was the, the fundamental or initial concern was about how she was trading you know, securities. Um, so you see a lot of times that false statements, obstruction of justice, tax charges, that's not just in the China initiative. That is kind of the bread and butter fraud charges um, that come up. Um, and so, and especially when there's a plea bargain involved, you might see some charge bargaining and it comes down. But again, if the government is not doing the work to address implicit bias, is not doing the training, and the American Bar Association has great tools for prosecutors, if they're not using that, then we've got a problem because it's clear they're not addressing the root of the issue. Uh, Matt, Tur Matt Turpin sent in a comment, which I think you and I will agree with. She, being Meng Wenzhou, has a better chance of getting a fair trial than the two Michaels do. The two Michaels Matt is referring to are the uh, two Canadians that were arrested in the tit for tat struggle over the Meng Wenzhou arrest. Do you think the Meng Wenzhou arrest was a, cri was a criminalization of civil misbehavior? Should that have been handed, handled civilly? There's been I, I, some debate. Ultimately, I was persuaded that, in fact, it was criminal. But what do you think? I think there's been, just more generally, um, an increase in criminalization of a lot of areas, particularly intellectual property, but other areas too that would generally have been treated civilly 20 years ago. And so part of this is just kind of the over criminalization that is occurring. Federal criminal law has ballooned in recent decades. So I think probably, yeah, you know, what she's being accused of, it is criminal under US law. Should we be using the criminal law in this manner? And it, you know, that's a bigger question. So I don't, think the charges are specious based on what I have seen. Of course, there's a lot I haven't, but I think there's a bigger question of how much we want to rely on the criminal law to do this work. Yeah. Uh, Xi Xiaoxing asked the following, 
what's the impact of the fact that most targets of the China Initiative do fundamental research, not classified or, sens or, or sensitive research? Yeah, I, and part of it too is the definition of what is sensitive, what is fundamental, and you know, I'm going to draw on, this goes back to um, the Obama administration, the small yard, high fence uh, an analogy, which Sam Sachs and others now are using who, who talk about technology, that we need to figure out what is our small yard? What do we really want to protect? Yeah, we want to protect the launch codes. We want to protect highly sensitive information that could be used to make weapons or, you know, or other like maybe IP that's extremely valuable. Um, let's define what those are. And then let's erect a high fence, real barriers. And maybe part of that fence is the criminal law. But I, my sense is we don't even have a great idea of where we want on that spectrum between me dealing with human rights. There's no national security concern there. We just want, hopefully, people to embrace that. On the other end, you know, the nuclear scientists who create a nuclear weapon. And where on that spectrum are we saying we should, it's serious enough that we should erect barricades um, to having contacts, actually decoupling, or and or just make sure we try to deter in a way that's so strong by saying you could end up behind bars for years if you, you know, go across this line. Yeah. The, um, a, a slight, a, another framing of the Huawei question uh, from Nelson Dong, who's a board member of the committee and, and uh, partner Dorsey. Um, before the Huawei case, Huawei cases, the DOJ pursued another leading Chinese telecom company, ZTE, and very, they pursued them very vigorously and ultimately obtained a massive financial settlement of over one billion, uh, forced major corporate personnel changes, and had a U.S. special monitor appointed to oversee ongoing legal compliance. Are the Huawei cases being pursued differently? And if so, how and why? Is the defense response different in these two cases? Mostly this gives me a chance to just, you know, thank Nelson for all the great work he's doing, not just with the National Committee, um, but also he's been very involved um, more generally in, in trying to figure out how to um, address some of these, you know, issues with discrimination that are coming up against um, Chinese and Asian Americans more broadly. And, I, and, and so I thank him for that. And I have to say, I, you know, I really, I don't know. I haven't dug enough into all the filings and they are, you know, we've got a lot of documents to understand how much the theory of the case is different different um, under Huawei versus ZTE. Uh, and, um, and I think that is, is something that I, I hope a, a grad student or someone can really get on because that's going to require a real granular analysis as well as, you know, maybe looking overall at these documents. But when you, um, when you, you have these prosecutions, particularly of of entities, like corporations, they always settle or they have you know, some sort of deferred prosecution agreement because you know, your, your company is going to be torpedoed if it actually was criminally convicted. So there's all these ways, this happens with the FCPA too, to try to essentially plea bargain out. And that means too that we get less information because the further along these cases go, the more they go towards trial, the more information that gets out there in the public sphere. Yeah. I mean, the question I, I always remain puzzled about is, is, you know, 5G, you know, Huawei is the world's leader in 5G and we've, we've decided we can't have them in the United States, but the, the chairman of, of, uh, of Huawei, Ren Zhengfei, offered to basically give the technology to an American licensee and allow the United States to manufacture anything it wanted to. So basically, in order to maintain kind of decent relations with the United States, he was willing to do that and the US government. Um, wasn't clear, chose to basically say it wasn't, uh, I think the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State who commented on it said, if it was a public company, it would be securities fraud. I don't, Quite know why he said that, but it was kind of putting, you know, not allowing this to go forward. But it seems that that, along with negotiation of some kind of settlement over uh, Meng Wanzhou, would be a good way to to help the U.S.-China relationship at this difficult time. I don't think it will happen, <laughs> um, no. but you could imagine a, a situation where you agree to the extradition, you have a guilty plea, she 
There's no sentence. She arrives in the United States, appears before a, a judge, and then goes home. I want, I mean, I want this to be a trial where there's a lot of coverage and showing our system at its best, where you've got her lawyered up with great lawyers going against the best of the Justice Department. And that's how we show our strength. And, and one thing, too, we're talking about companies, the Chinese or American companies. And I think, too, you know, it's increasingly hard. I mean, some companies are clearly linked to the to the PRC party state, you know, those not just state owned enterprises, but just, you know, they have t close ties. But a lot of companies slapping on flags being like, you're American, you're Chinese, you're Japanese, uh, I think is a little artificial. And so part of it, too, is we need to ask ourselves, what are the companies that we're concerned about? You know, why are we concerned about? Is it because of their name? You know, is it because of their structure? Um, and those questions need to be asked too. Uh, by the way, Dennis Amari says the Huawei technology, 5G technology, technology was not offered free. Mr. Wren offered to sell the, a license. Dennis, you have a different understanding um, than I do. Uh, my understanding, it was free. Um, but feel free to email me and give me the, the information where it says he wanted to charge. Mark Cohen, since you mentioned Mark Cohen, and we're going to have to wrap up, we're getting close to the end. Does Professor Lewis think that not only have Chinese been targeted, but that the tech issues have been dumbed down with the FBI and prosecutors assuming that economic espionage are easy larceny cases and not realizing that trade secrets, civil or criminal, are actually very difficult cases to understand and litigate. Essentially, you need to prove that you have a valuable technology that is not public and that it was misappropriated. One federal judge likened it to a patent lawsuit where there is no piece of paper that you call a patent to define the technology. Do we have data such as decisions not to prosecute, length of time slash reliance on expert witnesses that would help identify that misinformation? Well, I'm, I'm certain that they've been dumbed down from Mark's level of expertise because he understands this backward and forward. And, and I maybe can get a Berkeley student on this because I, I don't, I haven't seen that data. Um, but I, I do think, you know, you know, when I'm saying that the Department of Justice lacks expertise with respect to China, I think there's also from my, again, you know, limited view in there, a lack of expertise with respect to understanding the intellectual property. And certainly Mark knows better than I that trade secrets are a weird part of intellectual property. The patent claims, copyright, trademarks, that's much more clear cut. Trade secrets have always been sort of a strange area to litigate, let alone criminalize. And so I would be surprised, and I haven't seen a level of nuance that I'd like to see among the people who are talking about the China Initiative within the Department of Justice. What I love about this particular um, event we're running is this really interaction. So here's Matt coming in for a third time. <laughs> there are significant similarities between the ZTA, ZTE and Huawei cases. The indictment against ZTE in March 2016 resulted in a simultaneously listing of ZTE on the entity list. That same process was generally followed with Huawei. Well, one thing I want to, I mean, a lot of people might not even know what the entity list is, you know, and this is dealing with export controls. And so the entity list, this is really talk about, you know, putting up a barricade, but then there's an unverifiable list, which is a step be, before that. So for example, Renmin University, major university, um, it was put on the unverified list, which makes it so university general councils are going to be really concerned when professors are doing work there, but it covers the whole Renmin. So if I'm doing work on wrongful convictions, that's still with Renmin University. So I think there's this whole separate, a connected area of um, entity lists, unverified lists, and export controls, which we can't address today, but I think that also needs to be viewed as part of this overall, you know, I think over-securitization of the relationship right now. And then Matt, ad Matt adds, supporting the um, person who questioned my understanding of the uh, Huawei offer, he says, my characterization is wrong, just to show I give full voice to those who don't agree. Um, one last we're out of time, so let me just go to one last question. Uh, do you view FIRMA, Foreign Investment and Risk Review Modernization Act, and other foreign investment review policies as a retaliative measure to China's made in 2025 policy? 
how do you think the legacies of these policies will change if we have a new administration in 2021? It's not really the China initiative, but it's tangentially related to the China initiative. Yeah, so we had CFIUS for a long time, and then that changed into FIRMA and FIRMA because we like acronyms that sound good when it's laws. I mean, I have, personally, I have no problem with having um, a, a hard look at when there's investment in the U.S. That just strikes me as smart. It's good to know what's coming into your country and why. My question is always, well, what are the standards? Who's involved in setting those standards? And then who's implementing them? The more that it is, you know, I see Congress, people making legislation who don't, I think, understand IP investment or China, that worries me. So it's the rejection or at least the underutilization of expertise in the process is where my concern really lies. Thank you so much. Um, it was a great discussion. You've upheld the great tradition of PIP. Once and again, PIP 2, <laughs> which I always have to give a shout out because I am loyal to my cohort through and through. Right. PIP 2 always asserts it's the best PIP we've ever had. But so does PIP 1, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So that's it. But Maggie, thank you so much. You were fabulous. You enlightened us at a time when there's a lot of haze. You really have, have shown bright light on what we need to, to understand. But thank you so much. And thank you for being the National Committee's Laudong Mofang. <laughs> thanks, Steve. And thanks to everyone else who helped put this together.